My name is Dan Heller. I'm the talking to the mic. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, I haven't done my vocal warm ups. I'm the uh, Cronhill Senior Lecturer in East European Jewish History at the Australian Center for Jewish Civilization. And on behalf of the ACJC, we're absolutely delighted to welcome you tonight to Professor Avinoam Potts' lecture, Finding Home and Homeland Jews in the DP Camps. Professor Potts' visit is made possible through the generous support of the Sunraysia Foundation. These events honor the memory of Dr. Jan Randa, Jewish scholar, survivor, and beloved educator of generations of Australian students. I want to also uh, acknowledge on behalf of the ACJC, the Melbourne Holocaust Museum. We're so grateful once again to be partnering with you to bring a wonderful event to our community. This is one of many different projects that we're working on with the museum. Among them is a research project and an oral history project that I'm leading, which is interviewing survivors in our community as well as their children. And what makes this project really unique is that we're primarily focusing on the experiences of Holocaust survivors after the war. So we're going to be creating this oral history database, which we hope will sit at the Melbourne Holocaust Museum and will be truly a unique uh, contribution to oral history projects worldwide on the Holocaust and its legacies. Now to our wonderful speaker. Uh, Professor Avinoam Pat is the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies and Director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut. He is the author of Finding Home and Homeland, there you go. Jewish Youth and Zionism in the Aftermath of the Holocaust, published in 2009. More recently, he authored the book, The Jewish Heroes of Warsaw, The Afterlife of the Revolt. This was in 2021, it appeared. It is a truly fascinating study. Both works groundbreaking. He's the co-editor of We Are Here, New Approaches to the Study of Jewish Displaced Persons in Post-War Germany. He's also the editor or the co-editor of the Joint Distribution Committee at 100, A Century of Humanitarianism, as well as Laughter After, or I don't know how to pronounce that as an Australian, maybe I'll practice later. That's Laughter After, we'll try. Yep, there goes bad humor on my part. In any event, it's a wonderful edited collection on humor in the Holocaust. And finally, he also is co-editor of the book, Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust. Now, in addition to his published works, Professor Pott is the director of the In Our Own Words interview project. This is a new archive of oral histories recorded with the children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. Professor Pott teaches classes on modern Jewish history, the history of the Holocaust, Jewish responses to the Holocaust, modern Jewish literature, the history of Zionism and the state of Israel, and Jewish humor. It is truly our great pleasure to welcome you this evening. All right, I, is the mic on? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. I won't say anything profound yeah. yet. Okay, yeah, good. All right, um, thank you so much. I am delighted uh, to be here. It's, okay. Uh, <laughs> mood, mood lighting, okay. Um, so it's, I'm very, very excited to be here. Uh, this is, uh, thank you for, Thank you for the very, very warm uh, welcome. And I'm so happy to see so many people here and thank you to the, to the museum for hosting us. Um, I feel like this is a little bit of a homecoming of sorts, uh, not only because I have my cousins here, uh, family who's here, but um, David who is uh, really, uh, Sluki has helped organize uh, the visit and I'm so grateful uh, to Monash for, for welcoming me and uh, hosting us here, so it's very, very exciting to be here. And I see uh, Rivka Margolis here, who was my Yiddish teacher at YIVO uh, summer program over, I won't say how many years ago, but it was a while ago. So it does feel very much like a, like a bit of a, of a homecoming. So I'm delighted uh, to be here. And Dan, we have a lot to talk about um, with this interview project, so we'll talk. So um, thank you all for, for coming out uh, this evening as you've heard uh, from uh, the lovely introduction, 
Um, a lot of my research and a lot of my work, and I'm going to talk about this evening, looks at Jewish life in the aftermath of the Holocaust and the DP camps. And I already met some people here who um, were born in DP camps or had parents who were very active in uh, leadership roles in the DP camps. So uh, it's always exciting. And I hope that we have time in the, in the Q&A to talk a little bit about that history and maybe we'll do some oral history collections as we're, as we're uh, talking as well. So as you can um, hear from the introduction though, I've always been very interested in a lot of my research uh, when I look at um, modern Jewish history. I'm particularly fascinated by the historical connections between what are arguably two of the most significant events in modern Jewish history, the Holocaust and the creation of the State of Israel. And today, what this evening, what I'd like to focus on in my remarks is what I think is one of the most fascinating and remarkable periods of Jewish history, but one which I think often tends to be overlooked. That is this three-year period between the Holocaust and the creation of the State of Israel, one which witnessed a remarkable rebirth of Jewish life in the DP camps of Germany, Austria, and Italy, improbably and unpredictably in the immediate aftermath of liberation. And you can see here, I'm going to come back to this photo in a little bit. Um, this is a, a photo of young Holocaust survivors um, on a kibbutz, an agricultural training farm that was opened at a place called Kibbutz Nili. And a little bit later, I'll tell you the story of uh, these young people. But one of the things that I always like to show about this image is that it's not really what we would expect when we're talking about uh, survivors in the immediate aftermath of the war. You can see these are young survivors working on a kibbutz, uh, smiling, uh, they look healthy, they're going out to work, they're dressed in work clothes, and behind them is a sign that says, Bruchim Habaim, welcome, welcome to our farm. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that farm in a little bit. But let me start with the aftermath of the war and perhaps some images which we're more familiar with seeing when we think about uh, the aftermath of the war. On April 29th, 1945, the U.S. Army liberated Dachau, where the 42nd and 45th in Infantry Divisions and the 20th Armored Division of the U.S. Army liberated approximately 32,000 prisoners at Dachau. On April 27, 1945, U.S. soldier Aaron Eiferman with the 12th Armored Division wrote a letter to his wife describing conditions in Kaufring, one of the Nazi concentration camps, a satellite camp of Dachau close to Landsberg. As Allied troops moved across Europe in a series of offensive against Nazi Germany, they began to encounter tens of thousands of concentration camp prisoners. Throughout the spring of 1945, American and Allied forces liberated numerous concentration camps as they closed in on Berlin. The battle-hardened American soldiers, Allied soldiers, I should say, were shocked at what they discovered. As Eiferman wrote, we have seen what can be called the living dead. Just two weeks earlier, U.S. soldiers had liberated Buchenwald, the concentration camp built by the Nazis in 1937, which was one of the largest concentration camps, probably stirs all sorts of associations and images. After Kristallnacht in November of 1938, almost 10,000 Jews were sent there, and during the war it became a major center of forced labor with over 100,000 prisoners in its subcamp system by February of 1945. Upon seeing Buchenwald liberated on April 11, 1945, a member of the 333rd Engineers Regiment stated, quote, my feeling was that this was the most shattering experience of my life. A U.S. Army chaplain trying to make sense of the carnage wrote to his wife, quote, this was a hell on earth if there ever was one. And after photographing Buchenwald, Margaret Bork White wrote to her editor at Life magazine, quote, the sights that I have just seen are so unbelievable that I don't think I will believe them until I've actually seen the photographs. One journalist wrote, Buchenwald is beyond all comprehension. You just can't understand it even when you've seen it. 
But in the case of the aptly named kibbutz, Bochenwald, just a few days before they opened their farms, uh, the young survivors approached a young Jewish army chaplain by the name of Herschel Schachter, asking for his assistance to create their farm. With the assistance of Schachter and an army, an American colonel, the kibbutz secured a Nazi estate near Egendorf, making their kibbutz the first kibbutz hachsherar, the first agricultural training farm, to be formed in the DP camps of the U.S. zone in Germany in June 3rd, 1945. Now this model, you can see here this image of the young survivors at Kibbutz Buchenwald, on the wall here written Kibbutz Buchenwald, here they are plowing the fields. Here are members of Kibbutz Buchenwald preparing for work. This model would become such an appealing option for thousands of Jewish youth in post-war Germany that 40 such farms would be opened on the estates of former Nazis and German farmers, thanks in no small part to the assistance of Jewish soldiers and chaplains who worked together with survivors after the war to help them acquire the land. In the case of Kibbutz Buchenwald, the young survivors who gathered together on this farm decided to keep a diary to record their experiences in the first weeks after liberation. And what they wrote there captured the chaos and the disorientation of those first few weeks, but also helped to explain why many young people would gravitate to this sort of a living arrangement in the aftermath of the war. So as they wrote in their diary, the Jews suddenly faced themselves. Where now? Where to? They saw that they were different from all the other inmates of the camp. For them, things were not so simple. To go back to Poland, to Hungary, to streets empty of Jews, towns empty of Jews, a world without Jews, to wander in those lands, lonely, homeless, always with the tragedy before one's eyes, and to meet again a former Gentile neighbor who would open his eyes wide and smile, remarking with double meaning, what, Yankel, you're still alive? Yes, the Jews faced themselves. Was our tragedy only beginning? As a number of Jewish survivors of Buchenwald wrote soon after liberation, in the wake of tremendous destruction, the future was uncertain. And yet, despite the disorder and confusion, the surviving Jewish population quickly organized itself, asserting its presence, vitality, and resilience. And here you can see a map of uh, the liberation of Germany, uh, the, the liberation of the major Nazi camps in 1944 and 45. So most of the uh, camps that I'm gonna speak about this evening I don't know if this pointer is working, no, are located in the American zone. So we've been talking about Buchenwald, Ordruf, and we're gonna talk about camps by Dachau, Landsberg, and elsewhere. And I'll explain this constituted the American zone of occupation. Uh, the British zone would be uh, further to the north, for example, where Bergen-Belsen uh, was liberated. And here you can see a photo of one uh, U.S. Army chaplain who I'll talk about, Abraham Klausner, with survivors not long after liberation. If, if it's, I don't know if, the, if you can see the images okay like this. Yes? Okay, fine. Um, here's another image. This is Buchenwald not long after uh, liberation. This is a U.S. Army chaplain by the name of Rabbi Herschel Schachter, also the same chaplain who helped the young survivors acquire the farm for their estate for Kibbutz Buchenwald, leading uh, services uh, not long after liberation. Um, and this was Pesach Sheni, so uh, they were marking uh, about a month after the liberation of, of the camps. So you can see that all of this had to be done in what was an enormously chaotic situation that existed in post-war Germany. Here you can see this slide, which is the map of the uh, four zones of partition of Germany after the war. So as I mentioned, most of the camps that we're looking at here, uh, the black dots are different uh, displaced persons camps, are in the American zone of occupation in Germany, what's this beige uh, color. To the left of that in the purple is the French zone of occupation. Above that in the green is the British zone of occupation. And to the right of that uh, is the Soviet zone of occupation, I guess sort of a pink salmon uh, color. 
In the first days and weeks following the liberation of Germany by the Allied forces, the country was inundated with the liberated captives of the Nazi regime who sought to make sense of their new situation. With the conclusion of the war on May 8th, up to 10 million forced laborers, prisoners of war, and other displaced persons flooded the roads of Germany in the desire to return home. You can see here the four zones of occupation. The majority of the Jewish population, perhaps some 35,000 out of about 50,000 liberated in Germany itself, were in the American zone of occupation, many of them in the area located around Munich. While there were millions of displaced persons who were successfully returned to their home countries by the U.S. Army, there were about 1.5 million refugees who avoided repatriation for fear of being branded collaborators upon their return home. So I just want to get you, we're going to talk just about Jewish displaced persons this evening, but they're a very, very small percentage of a much larger uh, percentage of uh, displaced persons after the war, POWs, refugees, forced laborers, etc., who are also uh, being organized by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration after the war. And according to statistics that they kept, there are about 1.5 million DPs in Germany, Austria, and Italy. And of that, in the first month after liberation, they counted about 53,000 Jews. So there were 900,000 Poles, 140,000 uh, Baltic uh, people from Baltic countries, 120,000 Hungarians, and a variety of other uh, European nationalities. Singled out for extermination by the Nazis, Jews were the least likely to have survived the war and thus constituted this very small percentage of refugees in Germany upon liberation. And immediately following liberation, while most of those 10 million other displaced persons, POWs and forced laborers, made the decision to return home with ease, for the 50,000 or so Jewish DPs, this was not such an easy decision, as we heard explained by the survivors of Kibbutz Buchenwald. They were unsure of what awaited them at home, often fairly certain that their families had been destroyed during the war. But staying in a DP camp also meant that they had to face the fact that they would continue to live among other collaborators who had also refused to return home. Because in the initial period after uh, liberation, displaced persons were categorized according to country of national origin from enemy and allied countries. And so Jews who survived were initially placed with former collaborators from their countries of origin in the DP camps. This was keeping with allied policy, which defined a displaced person, as you can see here, as any civilian who, because of the war, was living outside the borders of his or her own country and who wanted to but could not return home or find a home without assistance. Um, so we'll talk about this idea of home and where one would return to a home, but also this desire on the part of the international community to essentially categorize people according to an international filing system of citizenship. But what do you do with the people who have been rendered stateless, who have been displaced, who have been stripped of their citizenship and have nowhere to go, nowhere to return to? This is the situation you could see at the title slide. So after finding home and homeland, this idea of no place for the displaced, right? Where to go? Jewish DPs who made the choice to remain in Germany thus faced a choice. They could remain in a displaced persons camp which generally were German military barracks or former POW and slave labor camps. Tent cities often had been hastily erected. Perhaps industrial housing had been repurposed for large numbers of refugees. Or they could decide that they would leave uh, the protection of a displaced persons camp if they chose to settle and were free living in a German city. Um, and some DPs, but a much smaller percentage, decided to uh, settle in German cities. About 15,000 German Jewish dis uh, survivors decided to move to um, the German cities. Abraham Klausner, you can see here, was a US Army chaplain, actually the second chaplain to reach uh, Dachau after liberation. And after uh, he reached Dachau, he began to tour around uh, the DP camps in the American zone of occupation. It's actually quite a story as to how he ended up in 
Dachau. He was a reform rabbi who had received his ordination in the United States in 19, uh, he was uh, about 29 years old. So you can see a rather young man in this picture, born in 1915. Um, in 1944, he sent from the United States uh, to France after uh, D-Day and the Allied invasion of France. And he's stationed in the northern part of France, ostensibly to be there to minister to uh, soldiers. Um, and uh, he's in, in the spring of 1945, he's still in the northern part of France, and they receive a letter uh, from a soldier in the Munich area. And they say, we need a rabbi here. There's a large congregation of Jews that we have found in the area around Munich. And he has no idea what this means, right? What does this mean, a large congregation of Jews? He doesn't realize that they're talking about a concentration camp that's been liberated with a large number of Jews. So he goes down to, um, to Dachau, what he discovers is Tahau. There's another rabbi who's the first chaplain, Rabbi Eli Bonin is the first chaplain to enter Dachau. He goes into Dachau and he tells a story actually of entering a barrack there in Dachau. And um, he walks in there, he spoke Yiddish, and uh, he walks into a barrack. This is just a few days after liberation and a voice calls down to him from one of the top uh, you know, shelves, the bedding shelves, and says, are you from America? He says, yes. He says, uh, perhaps you know my brother. He thinks to myself, how, how am I going to know his brother? He says, well, uh, his name is uh, Avram Spiro, and he's a rabbi like you in the U.S. Army. And so he says, yes, I do know your brother. He's here uh, in Germany, and he's able to reconnect these two brothers. And so Klausner actually decides, he's a very interesting figure, he decides that he's basically, this is his mission. He, he goes AWOL, he leaves his unit uh, against, you know, they were supposed to go somewhere else. He says, I'm staying in Munich, I'm staying where these Jews have been liberated. And he says, I have to do everything I can to help these people. And so uh, he begins to tour around the American zone of occupation. And he conducts a survey of the conditions that are being faced by the liberated Jews. And uh, he visits approximately 14,000 Jews living in 17 displaced persons camps one month after liberation. And he finds deplorable conditions, poor accommodations, no plumbing, no clothing, rampant disease, continued malnourishment, and a lack of any plan on the part of the American military. Liberated, but not free. That is the paradox of the Jew, Klausner concludes in his report to his commanding officer. Um, he begins to do anything that he can. He uh, helps Jews bury the dead. He begins to assign death certificates, but quickly the surviving population realizes that he is going to be their point person. Anything they need, they should go see Klausner. Motivated by this encounter that he has with a survivor from Dachau, he quickly begins to make lists of survivors in order to reunite families. And he urges soldiers to provide food for the Jews. He commandeers hospitals for the use of refugees. Some of you might be familiar with a place called saint Antillian. He works together with uh, Zalman Grinberg, a Jewish doctor from Kovno, to take over this hospital, to turn it into a hospital that had been a hospital for the Wehrmacht, to make it a hospital uh, for, for the Jewish refugees. He uses the U.S. military mail service in defiance of U.S. Army regulations to help Jews find their families. And you can see here, he begins to compile this list of uh, surviving Jews in a collection that he calls Sheri Tapleta, or Sheri Tapleta, the surviving remnant. Um, in a testimony taken many years after the war, Klausner recalled developing a tracing service for the survivors, many of whom had walked, traveled by various means to reach the American zone of Germany. And as he described it in an interview that he did with the Holocaust Museum in Washington, people came out of Eastern Europe into Munich and we set up a large tracing program. Besides the, the books that were published, this is the list of, of names of survivors, we had a center in Munich at the Deutsches Museum first, where people came from all over Europe and came asking about their families. People would come 
and tear the pages out of the books. And we would have to feed the tables with more books. And then we would nail the pages down so that they would last a little bit longer. But if a person came and they found a name in the book, they would go over to the wall. It was a very large wall. And they'd write a note on it on the wall saying, for example, I was here addressing it to a parent or a child. I've been looking for you and I'm going to be going here so that people could find each other. And I'm, I'm looking at this wall and I'm imagining people writing their names, where they've been, where they're going. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful film that some people might be familiar with. It's called Langes del Weg, um, which was one of the first movies that was created by survivors after the war in the American zone of occupation. And it depicts the story of a, of a young man who has survived the war, uh, David. He gets separated from his mother doesn't know what happens to his parents, and they're crisscrossing Europe. This was made in the American zone in 1948, crisscrossing Europe, trying to find each other, right? And we know people, families got separated. They couldn't find each other. It took years. This was long before Facebook, right? Um, so in this way, Klausner tried to help families, sometimes orphan children, reconnect. And after the war, he describes how he and other chaplains confronted uh, an American military occupation force that was largely unequipped to deal with such a large population of refugees. The American military had been trained to fight and defeat Germany, something they did successfully, but this was not a force that was meant to care for refugees. And so while organizing amongst themselves, the DPs and chaplains like Klausner continued to describe their poor conditions. Finally, in response, so I'll just skip ahead here, you can see, uh, two brothers that got reunited in St. Italian. Here's Klausner speaking at the forced uh, post-war uh, Zionist conference in Munich. He plays a very important role also in helping the surviving population organize the Central Committee of Liberated Jews and also ardently advocating for a Zionist solution to the stateless situation of the surviving population. But while organizing amongst themselves, they describe the poor conditions. And finally, in response, President Truman uh, dispatches Earl Harrison to the DP camps to assess the situation in August of 1945. Klausner's efforts fighting the American military's indifference to the plight of the newly liberated survivors culminated uh, when he accompanied Harrison, and you can see here, um, on a tour throughout the DP camps in July of 1945. Harrison publishes a scathing report that he writes back um, describing the plight of the displaced Jews in Europe. And he summarizes it this way. He says, as matters now stand, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. They are in concentration camps in large numbers under our military guard instead of SS troops. Harrison proposed that Jews be separated into their own camps until then, if we, as we've described, they were forced to live in camps with other national groups and collaborators. And quite importantly, he also recommends the best way to solve the stateless situation of the Jewish DPs is to grant 100,000 immigration certificates to Palestine immediately. Now, you can imagine the British were not very happy with this suggestion because uh, essentially, the 1939 white paper policy was still in effect, limiting migration. But they also couldn't say to the Americans, right, um, you know, thanks but no thanks. So they end up promote, proposing a committee of inquiry, the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, to investigate the situation. And interestingly, they come back with the same suggestion in April of 1946 after interviewing the surviving population. Where do you want to go? 95% say, I'd like to go to land, to live in the land of Israel. And they also recommend uh, immigration to the land of Israel. Under the guidance of Truman and General Eisenhower, the Americans swiftly respond to Harrison's recommendations to re recognize the Jews as a distinct nationality who would be housed in exclusively Jewish camps and to aid their eventual migration from Germany. In late 1945, operation of the camps was administered either entirely by the UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, but assisted, especially in the case of the Jewish DP camps, 
by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which provided much of uh, the supplies and the rations that were needed for the surviving Jewish population. Uh, one of Harrison's recommendations is also to appoint an advisor for Jewish affairs. Uh, the first one is Rabbi Judah Nadich, who also becomes an unofficial spokesman for the um, to Jewish newspapers advocating for the surviving population. Truthfully, though, one of the most important things that uh, happens after the Harrison Report and the creation of these separate Jewish displaced persons camps was that it creates a situation that allows for the survivors to begin to advocate for themselves, to help themselves, to organize their own lives. And as Jews were allowed to create separate Jewish camps, they quickly developed a fiercely independent political framework, which as, as I've said, was ardently Zionist in nature, that actively and vociferously spoke out on behalf of the needs of the survivors. Early in 1946, the allied armies and the relief agencies like UNRWA recognized the authority of the organized Jewish displaced persons to advocate on their own. In February of 1946, the first Congress of the surviving population elected the Central Committee of Liberated Jews. Zalman Grinberg became the first uh, president of the Central Committee. And similarly, in September of 1945 in Bergen-Belsen in the British zone, Yosela Rosensaft became the official representative in uh, the British zone. Now, you can see here in this picture, it gives us a sense of how affairs were operated. So each different Jewish DP camp had a central committee, that a camp committee that uh, represented the, um, the surviving Jewish population in the camps. You can see here a representative from UNRWA on the left talking to somebody from the American military, talking to uh, actually Leo Schwartz here, who was uh, the head of the Joint Distribution Committee who oversaw operations in the American zone of occupation. And these three authorities oversaw all the elements of sort of the structure of, of life in the zone of occupation, but the Jewish DPs advocated for themselves and their own needs in uh, the DP camps. There you can see another picture of Leo Schwartz. And it's a whole, I won't get into it now. Maybe in the Q&A we can talk about a whole story about Schwartz could not stand Abe Klausner, and Klausner could not stand Schwartz. Um, and, uh, because Klausner, who stayed behind, was constantly complaining, the Americans aren't doing enough, the Army's not doing enough, the Joint's not doing enough, the Joint got here too late, we need more rations, we need more of everything. So of course, this bothered Leo Schwartz tremendously. And he said the most successful thing that he managed to do in his whole time in Germany was to get a Klausner sent back to America. Uh, and then Klausner figured out a way to come back to Germany in 1947 anyway. Um, but the other thing that, that ends up happening is that, as I've said, there is this ardently Zionist uh, political framework and Jewish DPs who clearly represent their sort of ardent desire to um, move to Israel. And much to the surprise of the leadership from the Yishuv, and here you can see here David Ben-Gurion coming in October of 1945, this was not what they had expected. In fact, they had no idea what to expect among the surviving population. They thought that most of the population had been destroyed. Most of uh, the leadership of the Zionist movements had been destroyed. So he was very surprised to see this. And actually, you can just see this. So this is October of 45. He's meeting with Irving Haymont. And of course, the ubiquitous, if you know, like Woody Allen, Zelig, right? So Klausner shows up everywhere. Um, so there's Klausner on, on that um, tour as well. Um, and what, what happens, interestingly, is... Ben-Gurion, when he comes in the fall of 1945, realizes that there's a real opportunity here because there's an American occupation authority that's very friendly to the needs of the DPs. And there's an ardently Zionist population there already by the fall of 1945. And there's a growing number of Jews who want to get out of Eastern Europe, get out of Poland. And so they begin to work together with this grassroots organization that's called the Bricha, semi-organized movement of escape or departure from Eastern Europe. And they realize that the Americans are going to let them cross the borders, going from Poland to Czechoslovakia and then into the American zone of occupation. And so this becomes sort of a underground railroad of sorts, a pipeline leading Jews from Eastern Europe 
all the way into the American zone of occupation. And this becomes very important for diplomatic purposes as the Jewish population continues to grow and grow in the American zone of, of occupation. Um, and this also helps us to explain how as the population grows in the American zone of occupation, so I said we had about 50,000 Jews in the summer of 1945, um, over 100,000 Jews arrive in the next year. We're up to 150,000 by the summer of 1946, and then close to 250,000 by 1947. So a large population of refugees streaming in from Eastern Europe, but also creating a situation that the American authorities, as the Cold War is, I guess you can't say heating up, mm -hmm. freezing, um, they realize that they don't want to be dealing with this population of survivors much longer. They want to be uh, turning their attention to um, rebuilding west, the western parts of, of Germany. And so they're eager to come up with a solution that will help to get the Jewish uh, refugees out of Germany, which might also help us explain why we see such an ardently Zionist framework that is supported. It represents the needs of the survivors, but it's also supported by the American authorities, by the Joint Distribution Committee and others. So I mentioned this uh, Kibbutz Nili, which is one of 40 such uh, agricultural training farms that are open just in the American zone of occupation. Um, in the case of uh, this farm, so we have these young survivors who are um, all part of a Zionist youth movement that's been created in the DP camps. It's called Noham or Noar Chalutzi Meuchad, so United Pioneering Youth. This farm is not just any farm. So these young people have taken over the estate of Julius Streicher, um, so uh, the foremost uh, Nazi anti-Semitic propagandist, publisher of Der Stürmer. And they've turned his farm, uh, Streichershof or Bleichershof, to, into a kibbutz, kibbutz Nili, with this acronym, Netzach Yisrael Lo Yishaker, the eternal strength of Israel shall not be belied. Um, and not only are they working on his farm, turning it into a kibbutz, um, here you can see the first Passover Seder that they're holding at Kibbutz Nili. So you can see these young people, most of the surviving population is quite young. That's who's most likely to have survived. Um, something like 80% of the surviving population is between the ages of 17 and 35. So very, very disproportionately uh, part of the population is young. But you can also see here, they're marking the first Passover Seder. In the top right corner, it says in Hebrew, uh, from slavery to redemption, right? And so they're also marking um, this. And uh, they rename all the buildings with Hebrew names, rename all the animals with, with Hebrew names. Uh, they're speaking Hebrew. And uh, meanwhile, not far away, Julius Streicher is on trial um, at the Nuremberg trial. So it, it is this very much this form of symbolic revenge that they are um, enacting. On, uh, on the kibbutz. But besides creating agricultural training farms and kibbutzim, um, you can see this sort of um, really, uh, you know, astounding kind of return to life that's taking place in, in the displaced persons camps. Um, young people, I think, by, as representing the future of the Jewish people, attract a great deal of attention, sort of the focus of uh, the future population. Um, you can see here sort of the demography of the surviving population, which one of the really interesting things you can see here. So um, this is surveys taken by the Joint Distribution Committee among the surviving population. The numbers counted, you can see that the population, 18 to 44, 86% in the fall of 1945, still 80% in February of 46. But one of the interesting things that begins to happen, as you can see here, is that by December of 46, so by the uh, first year after liberation, there's a baby boom. Um, and there start to be a lot of babies being born um, in, in the DP camps. And by some counts, this population has the highest per capita birth rate of any population in the world at that time, which one of my uh, colleagues refers to as, so we talked about symbolic revenge, so uh, she calls it biological revenge. Right? This statement on the part of the surviving population that uh, right? we are here, um, which has sort of this double significance uh, after the war. 
Um, as in 1946 to 47, this is the year of the baby boom. And one survivor noted that the first year it was all lonely single people, but by the second year, everyone had a baby carriage. And you can see, so a lot of studies of the demography of the surviving population, a lot of weddings taking place and people paired up very quickly and got married very, very quickly. Uh, this is a carbon copy ketubah. This is from Bergen-Belsen. So these were sort of uh, filled in, um, you know, and uh, run off rather, rather quickly. Here's a picture with the, the, the baby carriages. Um, as, uh, as the texture of Jewish life in the DP camps was so rich, right? So you have uh, children, you have a flourishing Jewish uh, DP press. Um, many of the sort of, uh, the, so you can see this one was uh, from the Neu Freiman DP camp, and it was called Bamidbar, right? In the wilderness. And it captured this idea of, we've been uh, liberated from slavery, but we're still in the wilderness, right? Until we can return to our home. Um, this is uh, the, uh, de the youth, the Shemar youth movement. This is a commemoration of the fifth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Sports was very important. It's sort of this uh, return to, um, you know, taking control over our own bodies. So there were sporting clubs and a lot of sporting events and people were sitting in a DP camp that, you know, unemployment was extremely high. So people were looking for things to do. So boxing matches were popular, tennis matches were popular, sporting events, chess matches. Um, I'll mention that historical commission, so a lot of the work that uh, that we do as historians of the Holocaust really began um, among survivors of the Holocaust who said, we have to document everything. So fulfill this commandment to remember what Amalek has done unto thee, to collect and record. And this, this is a poster from the Central Historical Commission calling upon um, survivors to offer their testimonies now, right? And it's a really interesting period of time because you can think about, right, this is the first sort of diaspora of Holocaust survivors who congregate in the DP camps of Germany. But there's also a realization that very quickly, this population is gonna spread out to the four corners of the earth. Right? And so we in the DP camps have to collect these testimonies now before everybody spreads out. And so there's a really intense effort, both out of an obligation to the dead, out of an obligation to this commandment to remember, but also an obligation to the future to record these testimonies, right? Help uh, to write the history of the latest destruction. This is a, a, one of the uh, historical journals uh, von Letzten Horben from the last Destruction, which is also publishing a lot of these testimonies. Jewish holidays observed in the DP camps. This is from Purim in the Landsberg DP camp in 1946. Um, so a lot, so David and I uh, edited a, a book together on Holocaust humor, um, Laughter After. Uh, and one of the interesting things, so a lot of the jokes that victims and survivors told during the war imagined sort of the punchline involved the death of Hitler. Right? So um, you can imagine that the first Purim observed in the DP camps celebrated the death of Hitler, right? This modern day uh, Haman. And so there were, um, you know, imagine today, right? Somebody dressing up as, as Hitler, what that would mean. but. Uh, you can see a Purim carnival in the Lonsberg DP camp, um, you know, uh, celebrating the death of Hitler. Uh, this is the survivors of Gada, flourishing Yiddish theater in the DP camps, um, young people learning in the Cheder, right? Sort of intense competition, really, to make sure, right, which direction would the youth go? Would they join Zionist youth movements? Would they go to yeshiva? Um, and uh, so I'll just, uh, I'll just, end here with, by 1947, um, you know, we've talked about 46 and into 47, um, we have this huge population of 250,000 Jews now in uh, Germany, Austria, and Italy, overcrowding that's taking place in the DPMs and growing frustration with their situation, which is that they've been advocating, like, let us go 90, 95% want to go to Israel, let us go there. 
and yet it's not happening. By the fall of 1947, finally, after the British have referred um, the problem of Palestine to the United Nations, um, we have the uh, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, which eventually recommends the partition of Palestine. And so you can imagine there's a great deal of celebrating um, the, the sort of prospect of finally being able to get out of the DP camps. But in a tragic sense, right, for most of the surviving population, those who do end up going to uh, the newly created state of Israel, in many cases it's because they're drafted and they go to fight in another war. So there's actually a very large percentage who are drafted in the DP camps and are sent to fight um, in the war in 1948. About 8,000 conscripted just from the DP camps in the American zone in Germany by itself. Um, and so you can see here some of this. Uh, this is advocating again for a solution to their uh, plight. And I just wanted to end with this because even though we see, so about two thirds of the surviving population um, ends up going to uh, Palestine and then to Israel. But we also know that a lot of the DPs end up going to other places. And so I was looking through um, the photo archives of the, uh, of the Joint Distribution Committee, which has great material on um, transporting. So this is a shipment from, of Jews going from France to Australia. This is, uh, this is going loaded onto a, a train uh, that's taking them to Trieste. And then this is after um, their arrival in Australia. So I just want to say by way of wrapping up that the vibrancy of the Jewish DP population shows that in a remarkably short period after the war, not only on the political, social, and cultural level did survivors return to life, but they did so on the spiritual plane, right? Of sort of this statement of saying, we are here, mir sein in do. And this rebirth experienced by the DPs allowed them not only to come back to life as human beings, but as Jews as well. Thank you. Professor Pott, thank you so much for such an engaging and panoramic whirlwind tour of the Jewish experience in displaced persons camp. It was really an extraordinary talk. Um, I think we should keep our discussion short because uh, even though I know you're an expert, I think the real experts are in the room over there. I'm sure many have stories um, from, from their own experiences and they'll, they'll ultimately enrich our understanding deeply. Um, so I'm going to, I hope you'll indulge me with just two questions. We'll We'll, we'll speak together for at most 10 minutes, and then we'll open the floor. Um, Avi, the concept of Holocaust survivors as a coherent group yeah. was not something that existed in the displaced persons camps. Holocaust survivors came from a diverse array of backgrounds, um, both their countries of origins, their experiences in the war. Um, and their experiences in these displaced persons camps also varied dramatically. I also, you know, one of the things that, that's come out beautifully in your work is that they didn't agree on everything, which of course isn't such a chiddish in our community. And yet I, I, I think that I, I'd be so curious just, you know, to, to add a little bit more texture to the talk that you've given, if you could speak to us a little bit about that diversity and about some of the key debates among Holocaust survivors after the war that we might see turn up if we were to open up a page of Bamidbech of the newspapers or, you know, if we were to, to, to eavesdrop on the conversations that they were having. Yeah, good, good question. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, I think, so we, we use this term very loosely right now that we say Holocaust survivors and we talk about survivors and we come up with sort of an overarching category. And I think as your question alludes to, right, it's an incredibly diverse group. Um, and so uh, it's interesting. I, um, Laura Yokush and I wrote an article together about, it was supposed to be a Holocaust survivor diasporas. And the first thing that we tried to do was to define this category of what is a survivor. Um, because the truth is that in the aftermath of the war, you have people from, we talked about sort of diverse national backgrounds, 
diverse, and we often lose sight of this, sort of the diversity of pre-war experiences, right? So there's lots of different types of Jews, right? Um, who come from many different places, who come from very diverse communities before the war, who go through very different experiences during the war. So you have people who are organized either according to place of national origin, even amongst the Jews, local origin, right? So people will organize themselves, their wartime experiences, and then as we know, there is a hierarchy of wartime experience. So it's it's interesting. I, I pointed to like the um, the Central Historical Commission, and there is 100% uh, in 1945, 46, 47, for many years after the war, there is a hierarchy of survival and a privileging of experiences. So at the top of this pedestal in the DP camps, you can see this happening, are the ghetto fighters, right? So they're sort of, um, the unquestioned place at the top, the ghetto fighters and the partisans. And it's interesting because you see a lot of the early leadership of the surviving population. They, you know, sort of the, the place and the role in the resistance, and this is actually not just uh, specific to Jews. This is among the populations in post-war Europe in general. If you played a role in the resistance, it sort of gives you an elevated political status. Um, but what's interesting is that then we see people with lots of different experiences. So did you survive in a concentration camp? Did you survive in hiding? The vast, I don't want to say the vast majority, but a large percentage of the surviving population actually didn't survive in any of those places, not in a ghetto, not in a concentration camp, not in hiding, not in the woods, but they survived in the far reaches of the Soviet Union. And this is only in, in recent years have people started to write about this. And I mean, in the last three or four years, really, are we seeing books coming out now that are looking at, so Eliana Adler is a great book about survival on the margins. You know, where, what was it like to be in, you know, uh, the Central Asia, in the far reaches of the Soviet Union? So we're just learning more about, about these experiences. And the truth is, that population that came in 46 and 47, that's how most of them had survived the war. The debates. Okay. So um, it's a very, very political population. I mean, again, Jews, right? So um, the, the, I, I mentioned that um, you have the central committees uh, or the camp committees, and there are elections, and there are political parties. And so... And this is interesting, actually, the political parties. Um, so in Poland, before the Second World War, the party that is sort of, you know, in ascendance is the Bund, right? The Bund is addressing a lot of the social and economic needs of the surviving population. In the DP camps, the Bund is really not represented politically which is an interesting thing, right? So um, even I found things where Bundes who are in the DP camps, there's no sort of Bundes political party in the DP camps. It's all Zionists and Agudis Israel, right? Those, that's the, and you have from the left all the way to the right. And the Bundes are saying like, we don't have our own political organization here. So vote for the Linka Polizion. That's as close as you can get the left Polizion to, to us. So, but there's political debates about what should the Jewish future be like and where should we go and what should we do with the Jewish children and, um, you know, uh, fighting over resources, which happens in politics. So a lot of that going on. Yeah. One final question for me before we open up the floor to the audience. So, um, you know, we're at the risk of making an assumption. Um, you're preaching to convert it. We are an audience that is interested. We are an audience that um, likely many of us have familial connections. But part of our work as historians is to make what we do legible to a non Jewish audience or to people who don't share this experience. That's also the work of the Melbourne Holocaust Museum. So if you were to make a case to historians who might say, okay, he studies displaced persons camps. This is sort of like a blip in history. Why, how would you make the case that this is a story whose legacy and impact is actually important to understand? What precisely is the legacy of the story that you just told for our community, but also potentially for our broader understanding of, of the history of refugees in the 20th century and possibly beyond? Great. Yes, great questions. 
the questions are so well formed and <laughs> really wonderful. Um, so flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's. So it's interesting because I think on Thursday we're doing the teacher training workshop um, and on challenges and opportunities in Holocaust education in the 21st century. And, uh, you know, this is something that I think is a constant. You have to think about what will students, 21st century students, millennials or whatever we're calling <laughs> this generation now, you know, no, this is a new, we're teaching a new generation, whatever the Gen Z, yeah. Um, you know, what, what will this mean to them, right? What will they get out of this? And I think one of the important things about this period of time that I advocate for, you know, a lot of our education, so a lot of students or teachers will say, oh, you know, we teach them too much about this. There's Holocaust fatigue. They don't want to learn this material anymore. Um, and what we find is that it's, they usually have been covering the same material over and over again. They're not learning anything new. This is sort of a very unexamined, I think, period of time that, you know, it's, it's in my, to my mind, it's quite fascinating, right? Because it asks the question of what do you do the day after, right? How do you start your life over? And I think for students, they can put themselves in that situation of sort of what would I do because it is natural to think of yourself as having survived, but then to think about what will I do after I've survived? How do I begin my life anew? And in your question, you also alluded to this, the refugee situation, which I think, you know, sadly in our world today, we can also relate to this idea of, you know, every year it comes out there are more displaced people in the world, more refugees in the world than were counted in the year before and in the year before, right? It is sort of a constant problem of, of statelessness and displacement. And it's remarkable that you can see this crisis that happens after the crisis before the Second World War, crisis after the Second World War, international community is not equipped to address, and we're still not equipped to address the problem of statelessness and the plight of refugees, right? So it's you know, I think that also can be a very useful way to say, this is why we should study this. Let's try to understand from the plight of people living at this time, you know, what they're trying to, how they can move on with their lives, the decisions they have to make. And also while you're living in a very transitional period of time on suitcases, the, this description of living on packed suitcases, you have to have a day-to-day -day life, right? You want to get married, you want to have children. So, it's a very, very complex, but I think a fascinating period to, to study. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be passing around the microphone. Oh, never mind. Uh, we have someone else who will be passing around a, a microphone as we go. So um, if you would like to ask a question, please do raise your hand and we'll, we'll bring the microphone to you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that probably um, survivors who ended up in the Russian zone would not have been very happy to stay there because it could have meant being sent to Siberia. Right. But I'm just interested if you could elaborate why it was the Americans more so than the French and the English that established all those DP camps. Uh, and what, what were the political reasons, if any, for all of that? And were the Jewish people were more inclined to try and get to those camps for a future resettlement, maybe even in the U.S.? Yeah. Thank you. Good good question. Um, so, and I think everybody could hear, but I'll just uh, summarize. Why the American zone, in, in a nutshell? Um, and it's interesting, you alluded to, so the Soviet zone, as you said, we can understand sort of why people, in, in the Soviet zone, you know, they, they said they didn't have a problem with DPs because nobody was displaced, right? Everybody, everybody should be there, everybody was there. The French zone, so there were DPs in the French zone. The French zone is an interesting thing that's also under exam. It's sort of a token zone of occupation given to the French sort of as a gesture. Um, but there were, and, and um, the JDC was, the joint was also working together with um, survivors and, and camps in the French zone. But it's really the, the British zone and the American zone. And in the British zone, you have this um, one very large camp in, in Belzen that's created. Um, but the, the British policies, you have the one camp that's liberated there, a very large Jewish DP population there. But most of the surviving Jewish population is liberated in the area in and around Munich. Um, so, um, and Dachau and a large number of subcamps of, of Dachau. Uh, 
it's an interesting thing who that population is. A lot of Lithuanian Jew, Jews who come from Lithuania who are brought later in the war, which is also interesting. So, you know, a lot of Jews are brought either on death marches um, and end up in that uh, in Bavaria or Jews who brought from um, Lithuania towards the end of the war to work actually helping with the German war industry. But anyway, so they're, they're in the American zone. There's a realization that the Americans are going to be more friendly and are also going to allow uh, survivors to or Jewish refugees to cross the borders and keep the borders open. And so the bricha, so you have this population of survivors who are there, organize very quickly, um, advocate for a Zionist solution to the problem of DP statelessness, the bricha also um, working together with survive people who have been liberated in Poland realizes that the, the American zone is going to be the place where we want to bring as many Jewish DPs as possible. And so there is an orchestrated campaign to bring survivors to the American zone. I think also because it's, it's a way to increase political pressure and they know that the Americans are going to play this important role in the aftermath of the war. The British are not allowing um, you know, uh, the refugees to come into their zone. It's more of a closed zone. So there's some very interesting factors that are taking place. And I think the, you know, the Bricha, the Jewish agency, Ben Gurion, when he comes in fall of 45, is sort of outlining a plan to bring as many survivors as possible to the American zone of occupation, which then as we see, ends up playing a really important role. You know, when we look at the connections between the Holocaust and the creation of the state of Israel, it's not so much that we know that the world did not sort of after the liberation say, okay, let's give the Jews Israel, we feel badly for them. It was really only because there was such a large population of stateless people that had nowhere to go. And the interesting thing is the Americans were not opening uh, you know, the gates to America either. They didn't change immigration policy really till 1950 and even after that. So Palestine, that was sort of, let's send them there. Yeah. Uh, partly comment, Does, I thought it was actually geography as well that the Russians got, uh, took over a sum of Poland, of Eastern Poland, and then they gave Poland, Silesia, Southeast, uh, uh, Germany, and then therefore you, you've got this in Poland, you've got this huge gap and the Polish people didn't want to go there. There's no point. Right. And yet you've got sort of homes belonging to no one. I'm and then go the to Jews, a map as yeah. you talk. Go ahead. Okay, and then the Jews found that and sort of moved south into uh, what then would become southeast, southwest Poland, and then was easy to get across to the American zone just by geography. Yeah, so you... That's, that was my theory anyway. Yeah, so actually we can't see it on this. Oh, uh, yeah, we can. So on this map here, what we're talking about, right? So uh, a lot of the... And actually it is connected because a lot of the repatriation of the Polish Jews from the Soviet Union, they are sent to Silesia. And then from there, um, this the Bricha is working from there and is has different routes, which I don't have a map of, but a lot end up going through Prague. And there's, there's stories also, which some of you might have heard about the population that's traveling with the Bricha, and they're told to pretend that they're Greek. So, um, and I don't know if this actually worked, this ruse, but there's a lot of stories like this that people said. I was told to say I was Greek, that I wasn't a Jew who was trying to get to uh, Germany. And so then they go to Prague and they say, I don't speak Greek. So they say, just speak Hebrew. Nobody knows what Greek sounds like anyway. <laughs> and, and, then, and then instead of going to Prague and then going south, a lot of them then cross the, the borders from there. So yes, geography, I think, is, is important in this. Um, you've mentioned Italy a couple of times, um, but your research seems to be largely about Germany. Yes. Is there much work done on the camps in Italy? And yeah. I ask because my father was there. Yes. So that's my personal interest. But is there is there much research in that um, in that area? Yeah, there's a few scholars now have been doing um, work on 
the on what's happening in Italy and it is quite fascinating um, and you're right so most of my research looks at the American zone of Germany but uh, Italy so you have I'll just stand up here and, and it's also interesting there's a couple of places that there's a lot of action happening because for Jews to get out of uh, Germany and then um, in many cases sail to Palestine. So they're hoping to board these, uh, these Aliyah Bet or you know, illegal, I put them in quotation marks, ships, which will set sail. So for example, from Bari, um, from here and then sail around. So they have to get into Italy and there are displaced persons camps in Italy. And um, there's been some wonderful new research on, I've seen, for example, uh, uh, what's her name, Danielle Lillard, People have done research with uh, the JDC collections because the joint is doing a lot of work with the surviving population. So this is part of these routes of migration coming up from Germany and Austria, going but down through Italy, and then hopefully, they hope boarding ships to go from here. The other place where there hasn't been a lot of research done yet, but I think is really important is Cyprus. Okay, so it, it, they get intercepted and then sent to Cyprus. Yeah. And this has to do with the British policy as well, because the British, until 46, if the, if the boats were intercepted uh, on their way to Palestine and they were intercepted as part of the blockade, they would allow the passengers to disembark in Atlit, where they would be imprisoned briefly, and then they would be counted against the quota numbers. But by 46, to discourage the you know, uh, Hapala, this uh, immigration movement, they said, we're going to put you in on this prison, you know, prison camp in Cyprus. And so from 1947 until 1948, you have 55, 60,000 Jews intercepted and put in Cyprus. And that's actually not much has been written about it, but I, I think about how traumatic that must have been, right? So you're liberated, let's say, from a camp. You make your way to a DP camp. You're put onto a ship. Then you're put, intercepted, and sent to another prison camp where you're forced to live for another year, right? And so it's, I think, another area that, that merits a lot of research. Thanks for your really interesting discussion. Thank you very much. I was interested in a term you used, conscripted, to go to Israel. Could yeah. you please in elaborate on that? Sure. So I'll go back to this slide here at the end. Um, so I write about this in the book. Whoops, sorry. I just want to get to the image here. Um, okay, so this is... Uh, Appeal for Support for Polizion Movement Against the White Paper. Um, wait, I think I... Oh, no, I don't... I'm sorry. I thought I had this picture. Anyway, so the, the context is from the spring of 1948. So it becomes clear in the spring of 48. so after the partition of, of Palestine advocated by the United Nations, but before the British withdrawal in May of 1948, that a war is going to break out. So already um, in the spring of... Uh, in, in the spring of, of 1948, so this is from the third Congress of the Shele Sepleta, and it says, the fatherland calls, as Fatherland Luft, stellt sich in Dienst von Volk, right? Um, you know, stand up in your duty to the people. And what they're talking about, and they're advocating it already at the Congress in 1948, is that those who are able-bodied should... Uh, they have a general gius, a general conscription campaign to draft soldiers to fight in the Haganah, what will become the Israel Defense Force. And so there is a draft taking place in the DP camps. And about 8,000 soldiers, a remarkable number if you think about it, between the ages of 17 and 35 are drafted in the DP camps of Germany and sent to Palestine to join in the fighting. So. You know, I think in the chapter I call them stateless, stateless citizens of Israel because they basically, there's also the third Congress advocates for tax, right? We should be paying taxes to support the war effort as well. So you have taxation and conscription taking place in the DP camps, right? So, 
Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just for a point of clarification, when I, uh, oh, sure. Just as a point of clarification, when I hear the word conscription, I think forced. So can you just clarify that we're talking about volunteering? What are we talking about here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and, and I think that's your question as well. Um, I guess there's shades of, <laughs> shades of coercion, shall we say? I mean, you know, I, I don't, it's, it's, I don't exactly know, because it's, it's quite controversial, I would say, right? Because how much agency do people have, right? They have been now saying for two and a half, three years, you know, um, right? we want to go back to our homeland of Israel, right? That's where we want, we're stateless, we want to go back. And now you have uh, recruiters from the Haganah saying, here's your chance. We'll give you a gun and good luck, right? So, um, you know, I, I think, is it voluntary, is it not? You know, there's uh, material that I found where um, camp committees said, look, anybody who doesn't uh, sign up for the draft, we can deny them their rations. So, um, you know, that's part of the conversation that's taking place. And again, the way that this worked is uh, you had the American authorities, you had the UNRWA, and then the joint provided the rations, but the camp committees were the ones who were responsible for uh, distribution of rations. So they could wield that power of coercion. Um, and there were people who said, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna, you know, I, I have no interest in doing this. And so actually in the Bund's collections, there's a collection at Evo of, from Bundes who were in the DP camps, they describe, um, I'm trying to remember the name they, they used for it, uh, this like coercion campaign that was taking place and they, you know, they felt targeted. They said, I have no interest, I don't wanna go there, right? Um, so again, something that hasn't been written about much, but a really fascinating uh, chapter in history. Uh, I've got two questions. One is, have you looked at people who, left the DP camps and went out on their own. And the other one is those who decided to settle in Germany, because I have a cousin who did just that also. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a few parts of that that are, that are quite interesting. So you have people who decide, um, and there's been, so I've looked at this a little bit. There's also a wonderful book by Atina Grossman um, called, uh, uh, Jews, Germans, and Allies. Uh, I can't remember the first part of the title, but uh, she sort of writes about the experiences of many Jews who end up moving into the cities. And obviously, so there's a number of reasons why, why people will do this. Either they may have a, a German partner or somebody who was originally from Germany and they want to go back and resettle. They want to reclaim or do what they can. It's usually for economic reasons, sometimes also for health reasons. So there's a large population um, it's interesting. So Ferenwald, the DP camp, I don't know if there's any Ferenwalders here, okay. Um, so the, the last DP camp, um, Ferenwald is an interesting story because it stays open until 1957, um, which is quite remarkable, right? So you have a lot of camps that are open from 45 to 48, and then after 48, a wave of camps sort of close. But Ferenwald, you have a lot of people who say, I, either I don't want to leave or I, I have tuberculosis. So a lot of people who can't leave, they simply cannot immigrate to another place. Um, so sometimes for health reasons, the, the joint, and in this book on the JDC at 100, we have a chapter on the work of the JDC in, in Germany after the war. This is a big problem for the joint because they're ready to sort of wrap up operations in Germany and there are these Jews who either don't settle in cities, so some do, and then they become part of the Jewish community and the Jewish community is responsible for them. But the ones who stay in the DP camps are still the responsibility of the joint. And then there's a second problem. I know a problem, I put in, you know, people can do what they want. That's the, some people go to Israel and say, I don't wanna stay here. It's hot, it's a desert, there's no economy, there's no jobs for me, there's a war. So they come back to Germany, right? Um, and the, the 
JDC refers to them as the hardcore, right? This is the hardcore population of, of uh, DPs that we can't get to go anywhere else. Um, and they end up caring for them till 1957. Um, those who live in the cities, it's usually for economic reasons. Um, they started a business. And in, I didn't talk about this, but there's also a big concern about Jews getting involved in the black market. Everybody was involved in the black market. That was the way the economy worked. But there was a concern that, so, and some of the people who do move to the cities, that's, that's how they're making their living, right? Um, Just oh. How would Jews that were in um, Russia, USSR, um, in Siberia, in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, how would they have known there? They wouldn't have go back to Poland if they were from Poland. How would they have known there to go on past Poland to the American zone? I mean, there's, there's no Facebook, there's no telephones, there's, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm sure Germany, I'm sure the, the Americans didn't put pamphlets there to, to encourage them to come. So how would they have known about it? Yeah. Excellent, excellent question. Um, so the way that this worked, um, uh, the, the Soviets have these, you know, repatriation trains and that would transport people back to Poland. And then wherever, so it's, it's really interesting because I was quite interested in my research for the book on the youth movements, how were they recruiting followers? And they literally, so the youth movements worked together with the Bricha. Uh, some of the leaders of the resistance movements during the war were leaders of the Bricha. So Antek Yitzchak Zuckerman, who was, um, you know, the deputy commander of the of the Jewish fighting organization in the Warsaw Ghetto, he described that he said we would go to the train stations, and meet passengers coming off the trains often looking for young people saying, you have anywhere to go, you have anywhere to live, we have a place for you, we have food for you, we have shelter, you don't wanna stay here in Poland anyway, right? So there was, and this is where you talked about, you know, if you open a newspaper, what are people fighting about? There was a lot of competition for followers, right? So the Bund was trying to convince some people to stay in, in Poland. Um, there was active competition on these central committees. Um, the Zionists were trying to recruit people and then saying, once you're in our movement, will transport you. And certainly after, you know, uh, the Kielce pogrom, for example, but even earlier pogroms that took place in Poland in late 45, 46, it became easier and easier to convince people to keep migrating westward. Uh, right, yeah. Um, no, so, uh, so, it was more organized than that. Um, what they would often do was organize, so um, there were about, I have a chart that you know, I can picture, of you know, about 110,000 people who traveled with the Bricha in 46. Um, over uh, over 35,000 of them were organized in these kibbutz groups. So they would literally organize groups to travel together. They would say, so for young people, they would say, here's 25, here's 50, we'll put together a group of 100 people, we're gonna travel together, um, and we'll have a guide. So it was quite organized in that way. Um, and even there would be groups of families that would travel together. Sometimes people would come on their own, but often it was sort of a more organized than that. Here's the route, here's where you cross the border, here's where you change the train. Um, so it's, yeah, it's quite remarkable if you think about it, how this movement, again, no Facebook, you know, no, uh, it, it got organized uh, to, you know, a pipeline to, to help people immigrate. Abby, I want to thank our audience for the example. <laughs> I'm just going to introduce Associate Professor David Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Um, I'm David Sluke. I'm Associate Professor, uh, I should say Lottie Smorgan, Associate Professor for Contemporary Jewish Life and Culture, so I don't get in trouble. Um, and just on behalf of ACJC, on behalf of the Melbourne Holocaust Museum, I want to thank everyone for coming out. I know that, you know, the world is very uncertain and um, it takes a lot of um, moxie for us all to <laughs> be here in a room in close quarters. So Overcoming, I think that you know one one thing that Avi has shown us with his talk is that there is just something 
intangible about being together, learning, uh, that Zoom can't capture. So it is just such, I mean, I've, you know, I've been back in Australia for two and a half years and this is the first time I've like stood in front of a group of people and seen your faces. So like, I'm just emotional about being here, but, um, thank you Avi for that. You know, I've been, um, a fan of yours and, and then a, a friend and collaborator for many years. So um, the opportunity to get to do this work and keep our roadshow, make our roadshow international has been truly amazing. I just want to announce a couple more things coming up with Avi. Uh, if anyone's a teacher or knows a teacher, anyone who's teaching in or adjacent to the area of Holocaust studies, we're having uh, hosting a seminar on Thursday afternoon uh, at ACJC at 4.30 till 6 o'clock. Yes. Um, uh, so please shoot me an email or come see me after and I'll put you on our list. Um, I'm sorry, it is limited to educators just because space is limited. Um, and next Monday night at 7.30 at Glen Ira Town Hall at the Theatrette, uh, Avi and I will be in conversation uh, with na the, the novelist, uh, the memoirist Natasha Scholl uh, on the I would say very controversial topic, humor and the Holocaust, based on the book that we edited. And we'll talk about, um, you know, the ways in which humor intersects with Holocaust remembrance um, and, yeah, all the sort of interesting work we've done. So thanks again, everyone. It's, uh, my God, incredible to see you all out here. Um, it was just amazing to see Avi um, do his thing and talk about this fascinating topic. Please stay, say hello, tell your story. Uh, you know, I'm sure many of you have are connected to DP camps. Um, and I hope to see you again. You'll see lots of us in the coming weeks, months, and years. So um, you'll hear more from us. Thanks.